Hey everyone, welcome to the industry show. I'm your host, Nitin Bajaj, and joining me today is Martha Montoya. Martha, welcome on the show. Thank you so much for the invitation, Nitin. It's our pleasure. <laughs> so let's get started with who is Martha? It's a puzzle. It's a puzzle, <laughs> but we'll figure it out. My family's still yeah. figuring it out. Um, I, I'm an immigrant from Colombia and um, have a couple of wonderful kids and a good husband. But uh, more important, we have a mission with a company that we have launched um, across the world, but come from great parents uh, that uh, own schools and universities in Colombia for working families. They used to do social, social enterprise before social enterprise was so famous. <laughs> and uh, two brothers that are involved in the business with me. Perfect. So tell us more about Act Tools. What is it, when it started, why it started? So Act Tools is a journey that literally started when I was in Colombia, funnily enough, because I have been, uh, I grew up uh, in coffee farms with my grandpa, my family, my uncles. Farm was part of the family, just coffee farms and you grow up and you spend your holidays, your weekends, your uh, every minute that you have free, you're in the farm and you're working uh, or else kind of thing. So it's uh, the family. And so when I had, uh, when I immigrated to the United States, I had a couple of jobs, but it kept calling me to this whole fact that I had chemistry, biology behind me. And the fact that I had that love for the farming mm -hmm. and more important that I came from a family that I has mentioned before on schools and universities uh, for working families. Farmers are people that are really down to earth uh, working farmers. And so I had the ability to connect easy. And so it's a journey of understanding farming, understanding the ground, understanding the culture, understanding that that um, not the educational level are not that great, but they're trying hard, uh, very good with the math, never underestimate a farmer with math. Yes. <laughs> they're very good about that one. Mm -hmm. And um, and so my first, uh, my first uh, couple of jobs, was sourcing for large corporations worldwide. And, and I noticed that the one thing that everybody wanted to do is try to make the most profit out of try to make, give the least to the farmer. Mm -hmm. And that one always kind of bothered me. And uh, I tried to educate the farmer as much as possible so they would be better in the supply chain logistics. So they will be not squeeze as much and still make money. So it's such a whole journey of understanding this whole world of farming around the world as I was doing international development for many corporations. And uh, eventually when I landed in the United States through a program here with a supplier to one of the largest retailers, I realized that the issue was not just a other countries issue. It was mm -hmm. the whole world issue, farmers. Mm -hmm. And that's when the journey starts about how do we inform both parties of the extremes of their supply chain about what's going on in the market. And that's how Actus is born, through that one, one thing to keep everyone on the same level of information. So you're really helping farmers because what you said is people are still profiting from farming, but at the expense of the farmer. And the perspective you're bringing in is helping the farmer with information and efficiencies in the supply chain. So tell us a little more about you know, who your audience, your customer, and the size and scale of your operations today. Well, and, and, and go furthermore into mm -hmm. who our customer is based on who, what we want to help the farmer right. is, the new generations are very young, wonderful generations that hardly have stepped into a farm. Yes. Therefore, they don't understand the industry, and yet they're making macro decisions based on not having too much information and not their fault. It is that really we don't have the information. So by giving the tool and the data to the buyers mm -hmm. across the world, they are going to understand the landscape of production worldwide and they'll make more responsible decisions that will help not only them to have the right supply, but also the farmers to produce when they're producing. Mm -hmm. So it is a, it's a two-way street. It's when, so when I started even this journey was, I want to help the farmer, but helping one farmer at the time is going to take us a little bit too long. Mm -hmm. How, who, who is the one who is making this impact the most 
in society. And it is the buyer, it is the buyer, whether it's a processing plant, whether it's a retailer, they are the ones making this decision. So our our best targeted customer is not only the farmer, actually the buyer of those macro contracts. Yeah. You know, food and agriculture is something that impacts pretty much every single human being on the planet. It's, it's a massive footprint and any, even a small change can create a massive impact. What is the biggest challenge you're facing right now? The biggest challenge we're facing is that before supply chain was called supply chain, it was called logistics. Yes. <laughs> so those of us who have been in the logistics now supply chain, mm -hmm. the new generations are not understanding how the real supply chain works. And there are a lot of great ideas that are just the iceberg of the real supply chain. So my concern is, are we going to deploy too much funding, investment, mm -hmm. human resources, human capital, and hit the wall, for lack of word, mm -hmm. to find out that that's not solving the problem. That's my biggest concern as a person who's been in the industry. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it is the fact that many times when you're on the other side of the fence, meaning when you're the supplier, you don't speak up too much because you're concerned about what you say to your buyers. Mm -hmm. And the food is essential to human capital. And so not saying it and kind of keeping it for yourself, which is what many of the suppliers do in this world, is not helping the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So having the courage to not having the courage to step up is one of the things that I see as a week for humankind, not only one, it's humankind in general. Right. And on the flip side, if you, you know, you've spent a lot of time in the industry and you've looked at it, you've had the fortune of being on both sides of the equation. What is the biggest opportunity you're targeting right now? The biggest opportunity, first of all, COVID-19 has been a good thing yes. in the middle of the bad thing. And it's a good, uh, call it silver line, because before the people needed toilet paper, nobody knew how the supply chain worked. Yes. Until they found out that there's a thing called supply chain because I don't have toilet paper in my bathroom. <laughs> okay. So we all, the toilet paper, the supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> I will we'll give an Oscar to the soup, to the toilet paper. Uh, so that's the biggest opportunity. The fact that the whole world has this uh, couple words on the tongue and now the discussion is going on. So yes, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to waste some money. We're going to waste some investment, some human capital, but at least we're doing it. Before it was kind of like an industrial thing. Somebody will take care of it and we'll figure it, they'll figure it out. And I just want my toilet paper every day. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that's a great opportunity. Now, on the new generations is how to entice them to work a little bit harder because supply chains still work. It's getting to the duck. It's getting to the, I don't care how many apps you have. It's, you still have to get sometimes to the duck. You have to get to the vessels, to the ports, to the, some, a farmer, a famous farmer in North Dakota said one day, I don't care how many tools anybody brings here, when it rains and you need to get out on the dirt, there's only one person who will do it, the human being. <laughs> yes. So true. So in terms of you know, the experience you've had in the industry, is there a success story or a lesson learned that you would like to highlight and share with us? Um, yes, I would say that um, there are a couple good success stories in the sense that we're starting to see um, that it used to be that the corporations were going towards shortening the uh, amount of inventory mm -hmm. in the systems, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was efficient, because it was economically better, the PL mm -hmm. looks better. And all of a sudden with this whole C19, we're starting to see the supermarket industry mm -hmm. talking a little bit more, yes. which is good, which gives a, a wonderful um, pipeline of planning and production line mm -hmm. on the back end, mm -hmm. which means we shortcut less a lot of things yeah. that 
could be damaging not only for the farmer, the shipping line, the trucking, the, everybody. Because at the end of the day, the one who holds the key is the buyer of those big companies. And that mm -hmm. is like a chain. So that I think is one of the biggest success now that having the inventory management is, is going to reshape a little bit more, reshape better. And then the second thing, um, I think the new generations are now very aware of the food, where the food comes from. Mm -hmm. And they used to, it was kind of like the thing, the Gen Z, the millennium thing, but now really it's like, okay, no, really, I care about the farmer. No, really, I care about the earth. I really care, it's not a bubble, bubble gum thing. Right. So both on the consumer side, there is more appreciation for where the food comes from and how it gets to their door but also on the buyer side, it's not all about just in time, reduce inventory, have more cash flow. It's let's step back and give some respect. Mm -hmm. Respect to the supplier because the consumer is like, we have consumers walking in the door and we don't have the product, right? Right. That's great. We, we learned something and as, you know, as bad as the year was, there was a lot to be thankful for and it has given us the opportunity to step back, reflect, and see things for how they should be treated and really reflect and, and say, well, this is why we are doing what we are doing. I think uh, we all have in life uh, faces that are one of those famous um, life threatening things that happen to us, whether it's a business mm -hmm. thing, a family, a health issue. Um, and you, you kind of get mad at life because yes. why, why, why me, why that, why that? And then a couple of years later, if not a decade or two days, like, oh, I, now I understand. And I see it yes. myself. Oh, I, now I know why I was distributing eggs in Colombia. <laughs> I now know eggs upside down. I know chickens. <laughs> okay. And, the, and now it's serving the purpose 30 some years later here with what I'm doing. Right. So it's, uh, it's um, a humankind which we're all in an experiment right now going on. It is good that it, there's a reason for this to happen and a couple decades from now, we'll turn around and see the amazing things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And I think in the food supply chain and in the food in general, it has waken up all of us, woken us all up and hopefully not to have what happened to the Mayans. Yes. A war because of food mm -hmm. and disappear of, of a, a whole um, uh, section of the world. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about retrospection and, you know, kind of having that uh, introspection on why something happens and, uh, and everything happens for a reason, let's pick on that and shift gears a little bit and talk about you and your life lessons. So I would invite you to share a few one-line life lessons with us that have been important to you or have come to you at these important junctures in your life that have come to define you in many ways? There's one big lesson that I never knew how to apply until I started working with corporate America. Mm -hmm. I was in a boat wreck hmm. and literally the boat overturned. Wow. And we were underwater for three days and two nights. What? <laughs> And I was in the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean with my family members. And you learn so, so milliseconds about survival. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you do is you take care of yourself. Yes. Second, you take the closest person to you. In that case, mm -hmm. it was my father. Take care of him. And then third, oh, my older uncle and aunt. Mm -hmm. Then, oh, my cousins. I was the only one who knew how to swim. Yeah. Okay. And then from then on, I became a leader. I mean, I, yes. I call it the crash course on leadership for me. <laughs> <laughs> crash course, managing that little boat, overturn, and just learn that lesson. When I started working with corporate America, I learned that the executives in corporate America do need to take care of themselves first. And I understand it. It's valid. Nobody has to tell me the story. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Then they'll take care of their families. So they protect themselves, the families, and then they start extending like that circle that I mentioned. So we need to understand 
where we sit in outside of the corporate America within that corporate America, whether it's as an employee, as a supplier, whatever the relationship is. And, and that was the biggest lesson I learned. And that's why when I have been working around the world, I, I kind of knew that all along my life. And, and, and I understand priorities for people. And it's, uh, that's my biggest lesson that I look at their circle and I understand where I sit on that circle to be able to close a transaction, to help them with the business, to buy, to sell, whatever that is. That's some deep insight, right? And to, first off, to have that kind of experience, right? it can, it shakes you. And what you said about, you know, crash course in, the crash course in leadership, I mean, th those moments make and define you. And to be able to live through that and, and reflect on it and tell the story is one thing which is in itself very important, but be able to leverage that and bring that to corporate America and also to the entrepreneurial aspect of it is wisdom. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and that's the truth. And I look at it now and when I see something going on, I step back because I was there and I don't want to be, when that boat overturned, Mm -hmm. And we went all under the water. Yeah. You really save yourself first. So you have to step away from people who are trying to drown you down. Yeah. You have to pull away. And that's what I learned. How, how much can I help that I can help and how much I'm going to help that I'm going to sink. Right. And um, that's one important very lesson. And also that helps me also in the helping my own community. Mm -hmm. How much can I help that I'm not going to be sunk right. or how much I can help that I would help and be productive. That's that's amazing and, and scary at the same time. Yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's a blessing. God sends you for yes. those. That's why I was mentioning. God sends you for some funny reasons to, in my case, as a Catholic, in some other religions, yes. the universe, whatever that is. But there is a reason we are sent through those paths for some reason. Oh, that's, that's deep. <laughs> Anything else you want to... I mean, it's a hard one to follow, but I'm sure you've had more insights and more lessons along the journey? Uh, I think the biggest one for me is when I was mentioning to somebody yesterday, the, but a company should exist to make this society better. Mm -hmm. Period, end of the story. Um, could you make money? Yes, but that should never be the motivation. And they tell you that all the time. But when your mission statement is one, let's say one farmer at a time, all of a sudden you're, whole company shifts and switches and wheels we're saving the farmers why because mm -hmm. i want my kids and my grandkids and the grandkids of the grandkids to have food and we're losing our farmers because they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. um so we need to gather uh, in our case we are in to help with them we were in for a mission of life versus a business and things will come yeah, and I think at a corporate level, at least in the U.S., it's moving from just capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Right? So we are starting to see that shift. It may not be happening, or it may be a little late, but better late than never. Mm -hmm. And and I leave one my major corporation, a client of mine, that they shifted from one to take care of the earth, mm -hmm. and everybody got behind it. And yes whether it's good or right, that's somebody to discuss, but at least we all got behind that. No, that's, that's encouraging and something that we really need. Mm -hmm. right. exactly. What other lesson do you have for us? The other lesson I have is I, 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 raising, raising kids is another interesting lesson for all of us. Yes. Because as you are juggling the business life and you're raising a kid, how do you manage that... Um, the, what you're doing is passing on to them. And so I have an amazing son now that works in Congress. And he was the little kid that went with me to every single farm. He went under the table and read pay books as we were in meetings. He, he went with me at four in the morning to do fish or people's water, water for the people. I mean, so raising kids that are going to be in this life for the right reason, not for the wrong reason. It's yeah. tough especially on, on societies where you have so much social media influence and so much pressure. Um, 
So I always tell my kids and they kind of like, yes, mom, we know, <laughs> take them to places where they can see poverty, yes, where they see not luxury. Mm -hmm. And so raising kids and juggling a business, it's, it's an interesting concept uh, that can go either way because you might be taking too much time for the business and or as a corporate executive, mm -hmm. taking too much time away and then you're not paying attention to the signs of the stress of the kids. Mm -hmm. so not all kids are the same, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the second lesson for me that they don't send us with a manual for entrepreneurship, corporate America, raising a kid. <laughs> somebody should write a book about that one, by the way. Please somebody write a book on that. I think because... I'm looking at the right author. <laughs> Somebody have to because it's it's a it's an it's not going to change. We women we men are going to be on on the workforce in one way or another one. Yeah. But how do you raise that kid to be responsible, not to go the wrong route uh, and stay on? For me, those the mo the most important investment in life is your kids. True, and what you said you know is raising the kids around you around the values you want to pass on, right? Giving them. They may, they, they're their own people. What they do with them is their decision, but at least as parents, if we are able to give them that kind of environment and share those values with them, at least we have been there for them. And I think that's, that's very important. And as they say, you know, if you come up with the problem, people start looking at you for the solution. So you should write that book. That's for sure. And, and I think that um, if you remember many, our generation and before our generation, our parents expected us to work in the house, help in the farm. It was just a done deal. You had to do that. This generation after that, it was like, not really. I think that's a little bit on the wrong, the wrong turn. Kids should go with us to work, get up in the morning and go with us. Um, do what we do because it's the be the best entrepreneurship lesson I think I've done my kids is be with me yes. and I got it from my parents I mean my Fridays every single Friday I had to go with them to work literally to work every Friday in their schools and Saturdays and the events for the professors and they it was a non-stop me working with the parents it's mm -hmm. my it was my duty to bring my kids on my working environment why because it, it it brings them some work um um the work ethics. ethic yeah 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 and the things are not easy by the way yes yeah and it's good for children you know to one see us in the environment where they see us as professionals but also to face some hardships where they know that they're in a safe environment but at the same time they're getting pushed Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen because when they step out in life, it is something that they're going to experience. Yep. Yes. And, and unfortunately, we have so much of the apparently easy money, which yes. is the 1% of the whole world, but that's what they see. So, so by us sticking and keeping them very close to us. So that's the second lesson is being a parent while you're raising a business or launching a business or being part of a corporate America or it's, it, I think it's one of the toughest things ever of all. True, so true. What other lesson do you have for us? Um, I would say that um, the other lesson that is important for me is about the uh, education, um, whether I come from a father who always said, and he educated working families, and he said, it doesn't matter what university you go, is whether you're good or not. I mean, period. And um, I'm always concerned about, I have to get, send them to the best university in the world, the H, the S le letters. And that sometimes could be uh, a baggage that is hard for the kid to overcome yes. and look at the real talent within themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that that's, that's a one that you, and I took the other route, which is, I never asked my kids to go to the number one university. I would tell them to go to the place where they felt the most happy and is and fulfilled of the ability to do whatever they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, because I've seen many wonderful, uh, apparently wonderful people from these amazing universities doing the wrong thing. Yes. So it's not about the university, it's about the family values and mm -hmm. you can send them to wherever. I have a, an amazing brother who went to college um, 
and then only two years at the number one university of aerospace engineering and he was number one right it didn't matter that he was in a system that was very convoluted because of our situation of colombia and he still came number one because of my parents and sustainability of the family and all that so education and i tell this because our engineers all our engineers of actors are in rural america yes. and it's not nothing new i mean everybody thinks it's new but we had it always and uh, these kids uh, harvested food fruit the family still harvesting fruit yes. but they are the computer science machine learning artificial intelligence kids so it's not where you go it's where you where your talent flourishes um and it's and my lesson to everyone and i let, read it on maxwell book uh which is sometimes smaller schools and universities are better for our kids true yeah that pressure to perform and and also the peer pressure there is a lot of research that uh, people just generally tend to think that i need to be at this level because i'm at the school and oftentimes that pressure is going to be the reason of your downfall. 100%, especially for boys. Everybody yes. should really listen more about this. For boys, that's even a more dangerous place. Um, and so that's why we're starting to have this balance here. Uh, so definitely uh, kids in rural USA, and, and my brothers and myself are always looking for that gem in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we literally have a mathematician that can do anybody and it's in the middle of nowhere in a farm, in the farming area of Mexico of blueberries. And yet I, she can take over anybody on mathematics. Her father was a mathematician professor, but she can take over anybody and she does. And so looking for that unusual uh, humankind, human being for your company, don't look around very closely, look a little bit extra outside and you'll find it. That was my number three lesson for sure. The the rural world has amazing talent. What's number four? Oh, number four. This is getting good. Always have lemon water in the morning. <laughs> okay. okay. There we go. I hardly get sick mm -hmm. ever because of uh, lemon water. And this is my grandma place. And it's serious because of our working load, our working traveling having that lemon water, warm water in the morning, it really keeps your, all your viruses away. And I mean it mm -hmm. um, in a good sense because we are exposing ourselves more all the time. And health at the end of the day brings me to the fourth. Health is the only thing that we really have as the most important element in life. True. And so, so true. taking care of ourselves, the exercise and all food and all that. And, and then the one lesson interesting for me is when I was in the processed food, Mm -hmm. I remember going into a juice concentrate plant mm -hmm. and I looked at what we had, what we're putting in there. And then I remember vividly going to the supermarket and looking at the brand. And I say, I'm not buying this brand, but I'm selling the brand. Something is not really right here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it brings you back to the core value of what you do, what you, where you're selling is what you believe in. So I went into fresh market, into the fresh world. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that the soil was not that great around the world, but we're, we're working on making our soil better around the world. Yes. But, but the reality is that selling or working for a company, you have to really, really appreciate that what you're doing is good for humankind. True. And it's interesting you know, that you mentioned you've gotten an opportunity to go and look at how a lot of these things, especially processed food, is produced. And I'm guessing it's one of those things when you see someone and say, this is exactly what I'm not going to do. And when you see the processed food, this is exactly what I'm not going to eat. And that's what happened to me. I was really shocked when I realized that that's when I shifted fast to the to the fresh market. Mm -hmm. What's lesson number five? Oh, this is getting good. I would say lesson number five is about um, uh, the somebody said the other day exit strategies, exit mm -hmm. strategies. This gentleman did five exits. This one is five. In, for me, an exit strategy is not a is not good if the projects if the project didn't stay alive on its own and it was sustainable. 
because that meant that you just were in to flip yes. business. So I can tell you today that 25 years later, my one boat of banana boat, banana boat per week, still going from Ecuador to St. Petersburg. Wow. That's my exit strategy. That's my showing my banana boat still working down there <laughs> or my Thailand pineapple, canned pineapple program still coming from Thailand into Mexico. I would say my concern in this whole new world of startups, in the world of venture funds, I understand producing money is important. And yes, you have to return investment to uh, investors. But if you create, what, what are you creating? Are you creating uh, a technology to turn around and flip it into a company that is going to absorb it, to be used within the company? Are you building a product that is going to stay in the shelves or um, whatever that is in within a company or you creating a company that is going to be a division of a large company mm -hmm. if none of those three exist you were not in the right business because you never meant to stay to walk in to create a company you created you walked into just flip and do money mm -hmm. well, flipping houses right you don't mm -hmm. own the house you make the house better and you turn around and you never were connected to that house True. Versus if I build the farm or the house and I take time of it and somebody comes and offer me now 20 million and I was worth, I don't know, three when I bought it, I'll have a hard time selling it, but I put my soul into it and somebody's going to use it. And I say that because one of the businesses was sold to us uh, in Washington state. The owners looked very much into my parents when they sold it, who they were and that they were going to really take care of the business, not mm -hmm. just take it around, turn around and sell it because it was made for the community. Anyway, my, my point is that in this whole fast track of startups, venture funds, it's hard because the noise is there. It's kind of like kids in Hollywood. <laughs> Can I make a, 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 build, a million followers and I'm making money like crazy? It was the same thing that is happening right now, I feel in startups and venture funds. It's that rush to get mm -hmm. in, out, and IPOs and all that. Uh, at, at, after a certain age, you don't look into that anymore. Because you're, what do you do? You have millions of dollars and what you sit on a board of a nonprofit or let's build the businesses to, land, to, to make the difference in society. And so if, if a young person is listening to this, you're going to end up coming back to try to do another business mm -hmm. and another business and eventually to sit on a board to help the world. So help the world through the company that you're building up. That's wisdom. That's smart. Right? <laughs> why, why jump around in circles to do something if you can just take a straight line and keep working at it pretty much from day one? And with a mission. Yes. Mm -hmm. Love that. That's Martha, it. Thank you so much for sharing your pearls of wisdom. It has been an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you for sharing your journey and the lessons you've learned along the way in such a, such a, you know, transparent and uh, humble way. We really appreciate that. And we know for a fact that a lot of our audience, a lot of fellow entrepreneurs appreciate that and will learn something from what you have shared. Thank you so much once again. Thank you so much. And I hope the best for everyone out there. Thank you.